original thing is he likes to race around the world in a 40-foot sailboat, or at least that was the size of the sailboat he used last time around. He's now building a 60-footer. Only Derek and 125 other people have actually completed this 28,700 nautical mile voyage. So I want to give you perspective on this. 400 astronauts have gone into space, and something like uh, over 2,000 mountaineers have made it to the top of Mount Everest. 126 people have sailed around the world alone, and Derek Hatfield is one of them. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege to be here and telling you about the Spirit of Canada story. Um, recently, I had the honor of meeting King Constantine from Greece, and um, during the introduction, uh, the person introducing me said, um, and this is Derek Hatfield, he's raced around the world single-handed, and, and the king looked at me right in the eye and he said, why? <laughs> why did you do this? He didn't even hesitate. I do it because it's a race. This is setting a goal, this is focusing on that goal, persevering through hard times, and believe me, there are some hard times out there. The, the race is, uh, for me, started in 1996. I'm doing a transatlantic race from Plymouth, England to Newport, Rhode Island, on this little boat, up over the Grand Banks. It turned it upside down, and um, broke some rigging, stopped in Newfoundland to fix the boat. And psychologically, I was having a really difficult time getting back on the boat, and uh, I was in a phone booth there talking to my father, who was a maritimer, and I said, bring the trailer, I'm dropping out of the race. And my father, being a maritimer, said, I'm not bringing the trailer, you get back on the boat and go to the finish line. With that little pep talk, I went to the finish line, <laughs> went to the finish line, finished the race, the sense of accomplishment was huge, and I was hooked on this type of racing. And um, so I started to think about what next, and of course the granddaddy of all single-handed racing is a race that goes around the world every four years, um, Moses mentioned that I'm number 126, but more indicative numbers are uh, t 80 people signed up to do this rate, 50 paid the first installment, 25 paid the second installment, uh, 13 of us qualified and got to the start line, 10 got to the finish line. And you can see we left New, New York, went to Torbay, um, that's a short leg, 2,800 miles. The leg two went to, took us to Cape Town, that's the longest leg at 8,200 miles, that took me 47 days to do that one. Leg three, from Cape Town to New Zealand, and uh, leg four, the most dangerous because of Cape Horn, and I'll tell you a little more about Cape Horn in a second, um, the stop in Salvador, leg five, back to the finish line. By the time I was finished, 35,000 miles around the world, 182 days spread over seven and a half months. Didn't have a boat, you have to build a boat for these, <coughs> these races, these boats are all specifically designed to do single-handed racing. I didn't have a sponsor, so I started building a, a small little 40-footer, uh, um, this boat is high-tech, Kenton Keel, twin dagger boards, twin rudders. It did 28 knots in the Southern Ocean. That's 40 miles an hour. Uh, you could actually water ski behind this boat. It took five years to actually build the boat, and uh, with the help of family and friends, uh, we called it the Spirit of Canada. On the way to the start line, and here you see the start line in New York City, um, 13 boats that qualified uh, spent a month-long uh, scrutineering process in New York, one of the seminars we do there is with a doctor, and he takes you through a day-long uh, session on doing minor procedures on yourself. In a previous race, one of the skippers actually uh, fell through the hatch and bit off the tip of his tongue. And he was able to sew, put stitches in his tongue, and stay in the race, with, with the help of the doctor and a mirror, of course. Here you see uh, the start of leg one uh, in New York Harbor. You uh, leave New York, you head over to England, this is the shortest leg at 2,800 miles. I managed a second place finish on this leg, and the behind um, uh, Tommy Hilfiger boat, which is a multi-million dollar funded boat, we were the least funded in the race. Um, the internet makes this a spectator sport now because uh, you have the ability to go on to the uh, internet and see what's going on in the boat on a, on a regular basis. It's the ultimate reality TV. You can actually choose which camera you're going to watch from on board the boat as we're racing around the world. There are some really bad times. Uh, you see skippers uh, crying, you see them uh, sleeping, you see them eating, and you're doing all kinds of things, but it's, it's a great, uh, great way to follow the race. Leg two, from Torbay to Cape Town, this is the longest leg, 8,200 miles, took me 47 days, and I didn't see anybody for, for that time. 
Communications on board are such that you have, uh, you could run a small business from this boat if you could afford the sat time, but you have access to the internet, all your weather and all your information, all the emails, all the media stuff comes onto the boat from uh, over the sat phone and uh, you spend about an hour and a half a day uh, doing, your, doing your communications. Sleep-wise, of course, the boat is going 24-7. Uh, on autopilot, 98% of the time, you have to sleep. All single-handed racers sleep in 20-minute catnaps. Sleep for 20 minutes, wake yourself up, uh, check the horizon, check the performance of the boat, go right back to sleep. And um, this, uh, this goes on for seven, eight hours a day. It takes about three days to get into that routine. Once you're into it, you could go on and do it 100 days, 200 days, 300 days indefinitely. Food-wise, because weight is a huge concern on these race boats, it's all freeze-dried food and bottled water. And that's, uh, that's what you have. You burn between three and 5,000 calories a day. And let me tell you, it's difficult to get 5,000 calories into you uh, when you're uh, racing a boat offshore. This is what I looked like in the arrival at the end of Lake Two. I came out of a fog bank at the, in the harbor in Cape Town. There's Table Mountain, all lit up from behind with the lights of, uh, lights of Cape Town. Lake Three, into the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is one of those extreme places that all sailors want to go, but as soon as you get there, uh, it's only a matter of time before you, you get smacked with a Southern Ocean storm. And you Picture of an albatross here. I remember one day being in the boat, shadow comes over the window, kind of scares the heck out of me because uh, uh, there's not supposed to be anything there that casts a shadow on the boat. I go on deck and there's this great wandering albatross with a wingspan of about seven feet and he's there, um, he stays with me for a day and a half. Uh, great company in the Southern Ocean. Of course, um, uh, legend has it the albatrosses are the uh, lost sailors in the Southern Ocean, so great company. The arrival in New Zealand was uh, very surreal. 35 Canadians standing on the dock, they sang O Canada. <laughs> and uh, uh, totally un 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 unbeknownst to me. Lake Four, the most dangerous, and uh, because of Cape Horn, you can see it's the farthest south that you get. Leaving New Zealand, I realized I, I uh, had a problem with the electronics, and on day three, went back to replace all the electronics on board and left again, uh, chasing the fleet. Now you're at the back. Of course, you're very exposed at the back. Arriving at Cape Horn, I started getting weather advisories about a real Southern Ocean storm that I was going to hit there. Cape Horn, of course, you have a shelf that comes up from thousands of feet deep, all the wind and the waves go through that gap between South America and Antarctica, and um, it comes up on the shelf. They've reported waves of 120 feet at Cape Horn, and a very, very dangerous situation. Storm started for me on a Thursday afternoon, and by midnight, it's blowing 55, 60, 70 knots, getting up into a hurricane now. Waves are getting 35, 40 feet. Uh, battled the storm all that night, all the next day. Um, four o'clock the next day, I thought I had had it beaten, and, uh, but I went down below to get an energy drink, came back on deck, and just before I could even take the autopilot and take control of the boat, this wave went vertical behind the boat, and the boat stood on its nose like this, rolled right upside down. I went into the water, and the boat rolled right over on top of me, and I'm underneath the boat. Huge explosion of carbon fiber as the mass broke. The boat immediately righted itself. This whole incident took about 13, 14 seconds. The boat righted itself again. I'm back on the deck, I'm soaking wet, but now the rig and the mast are all over the side underneath the boat. I'm looking at this and I'm just unbelievable that this could happen so quickly. I go below, don't even recognize what's inside the boat. It was just chaos. Couldn't find any tools, couldn't find any, anything to get rid of this rig uh, over the side. I had a knife around my neck, a leatherman on my belt, back on deck with the knife, cut all the ropes and the lines and everything. 45 minutes later, everything went over the side. I contacted the race committee with the sat phone that I had and realized that uh, I was out of the race. I was going to break the seal on the engine and motor into a city up on the Beagle Channel in Ushuaia. Very unfortunate to be dismasted at Cape Horn, but fortunate enough, you're only about 120 miles from land. Arriving in Ushuaia, um, the outpouring of support was unbelievable, and phone calls and messages started coming in. First phone call was from Andrew Pindar. He said, don't give up, stay in the race. I'm going to buy you a new mast. Second phone call was from Al Power, president of Tacoma International here in Toronto. He said, same thing, don't give up. Stay in the race. We're going to buy new sails and send people down there to help you back on the water. Within a month, we were up and running. Uh, new mast, new rigging, new sails. Everything's ready, and we're getting ready to leave again. I contacted the race committee, of course, as soon as I got there, and they said, if you can go back out to that spot and continue racing from there, you're qualified within the rules. Of course, when I'm in, in uh, uh, Ushuaia fixing the boat, all of the other boats have gone on to Salvador and finished Lake Four, and they're getting ready for Lake Five. So I left. Ashwaya took another 23 days to go from Cape Horn up to uh, Salvador and finish Lake Four. And the rules require that I stop in Salvador for at least 48 hours. 
stopped there for exactly 56. Um, didn't even shave uh, the whole time there and got ready for Lake 5. Lake 5, of course, is, uh, is, uh, was, was extraordinary because uh, the horse can smell the barn. I'm on my way home and uh, everything is going well. The boat's working well. And my goal now is to get to, uh, to uh, Newport and finish the circumnavigation. Up to the finish line, literally hundreds of people came there to uh, help me uh, in and uh, see me in from, from all over Canada and all over the United States. But uh, unbelievable sense of accomplishment. This is more than just a sailboat race. This is all about focusing on goals, not being detracted, and having a team, building a team, and getting to that finish line. In the end, even though I came last on leg four and last on leg five, the point system really worked in my favor because uh, you, you uh, get points even for coming last. Managed to beat the, f the fourth place boat by one point, and even though I came there four and a half uh, weeks later. Um, within a month, we started thinking about what next, and uh, the team was, was really um, uh, encouraged by all of this and all the attention that we got, all the media and, the, and, the, and uh, press and the sponsors were very supportive. Within a month, we started to think, what next? And uh, just last year, as Moses pointed out, uh, we announced that we're going to go back and do it again. And why do I want to go back and do it again? Because, um, because it's a race. Uh, this is a competition. Uh, you have all this experience now going around the world and uh, setting this up and doing this. And, and these races and this type of endeavor, even though it's very, very difficult, it's all about experience and adding on to that experience. So now that I know the way around the world, know what to expect and uh, know the conditions, I want to go back and see what we can do against the best in the world. And we're going back um, in November of 06 and starting the Five Oceans, which is the new name for the race. The Five Oceans itself it has a new format. We're starting in Spain. Leg one takes us all the way from Spain to um, uh, Fremantle, Australia. That's 12,000 miles uh, from Fremantle around the Horn, bypass uh, Cape Town or, or uh, Cape Horn and all the way to the United States. And that's 13,000 miles. From there, it's a sprint back to the finish line in, um, in Spain. Um, one of my sponsors um, coined the phrase, never give up, and that has become one of our buzzwords. And I always say, you know, if you're really down and you're having a bad day, have a catnap, have a 20-minute catnap, and uh, you cannot wake up from a catnap and, uh, and feel the same way and feel, still, de still feel depressed. So um, that's my message to you, never give up, and I want to thank you very much for, uh, for listening. And thank you, Moses, for having us.